Good evening. My name's Ed Mutum, and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Hello. By the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink or a mood-altering drug since January 5th of 1971, and for that I'm extremely grateful and uh, pleased for Alcoholics Anonymous to be in my life and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous allowing me to be a part of it. You know, it is a privilege. It's not a guarantee. And uh, God, I love being here. There's been so many people that I've seen this weekend. Uh, Cliff and Pat. God, we go back 30 years. I was at Matt's first meeting when he walked in 30 years ago. Wayne, I've known him through all his personalities. <laughs> And I'll tell you what I love, absolutely love about Wayne, is he's here. No, I mean it. You know, a lot of people find reasons to leave, especially when we make mistakes and bad things happen to us and all that. He's here. He's always here, and I love him for that, and I respect him for that. Uh, he's a good active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I love being sober. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love God, and I don't apologize for any of the three anymore. Used to felt I owed an apology when I tell you, especially about the God thing, you know. <laughs> and Cliff and Pat, my God, uh, uh, you're in for a treat. If you haven't heard Cliff and or Pat, either one, you're in for a treat tomorrow. It'll be a blessing, I promise you. Well, Cliff's talk will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love Cliff's talk because you know, with the people I'm talking about, we go back 30 years. And when, and, and when Cliff and Pat talk about that crazy household, I was there. I understand. I saw, I saw the insanity, but more importantly is I saw the healing brought about by the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. And, uh, you know, this is a place of hope. And, and I think sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle. For those of you who don't know me, no, I don't play basketball and the weather's fine up here. We'll get... <laughs> They always think it's original. Oh, how's the weather up there? <laughs> I used to have an answer, but I can't tell you from a podium anymore. <laughs> now I just say heavenly, thank you. <laughs> Beats what I used to say, I promise you. <laughs> and it's always the same size person asking the same two questions. <laughs> First question is, Al, oh, how tall are you? Six ten. Oh, do you play basketball? <laughs> no. How tall are you? Five four. Do you play miniature golf? <laughs> it's their deal, man. <laughs> and it's always fun coming into the airport, especially with these smaller jets now. It's purgatory for me. I don't know about you. But. You're just halfway between heaven and hell when you cram me in one of those. And, and uh, I used to think I had to do things to get attention, you know. All I had to do was show up, you know. All I had to do was show up. I, uh, I love Lee. I want to thank Lee for being here. You know, tapers sometimes get a bad rap, and, and uh, Lee always reminds me of, 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 of what I need to say probably more often than I do. And that's, uh, for years, I, I had trouble with tapers. I remember years ago when they did it, the reel-to-reel. -reel. Remember, Cliff, and they'd ask you, get your written permission to tape and do all that. And then uh, as years went on, it graduated. But I, I used to get, I used to get uh, stuck in my crawl a little bit that they were taping and selling tapes and making money off that. Well, number one, if you know a taper, and hey, hey, they, none of them are wealthy, I promise you. <laughs> but, uh, but years later, what I found out is, is it was... Uh, Back in 1988, when I moved back to Iowa, I had just gone through a divorce, and it was one of those wonderful ones where we wanted to say goodbye with guns. And uh, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rang like five times late in the morning. And as soon as I'd pick it up, they'd, there'd be no answer. And about the fifth time, my keen mind knew who it was. It was her. And about the fifth time it rang, and honest to God, it was one, two in the morning. About the fifth time I just screamed, who is this? And a little voice said, is this Ed M. that speaks in AA? <laughs> and I said, yeah, who's this? And she told me her name, and she said, I'm five years sober, and I was sitting here with a gun in my lap, and I heard your tape. Can you talk to me for a minute? 
from that day to this. Tape it, dupe it, sell it, do whatever you want with it. <laughs> you know, what they do is a ministry that saves a lot of lives. Appreciate the effort. Really do, Lee. Uh, I, uh, I come from a very elite group of people called White Trash. <laughs> it wasn't easy. We had a certain image to maintain. <laughs> when you have a place in society, there's certain things you have to do. <laughs> Car parked in your yard, go to jail a lot, and please come to your house. You know. <laughs> work, 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 work. And I loved, I loved Wayne uh, today. His talk, there's so much of it identify. I don't know about you, but my earliest memories in life was I didn't belong here. I didn't fit in, and something's wrong. Something's wrong, and I had no idea what it was, but I knew it was going on in me, and it probably wasn't going on in you. I knew that. And from a very early age, I didn't like where I lived, my family, and I instinctively knew that was all wrong. So I did the other thing that almost killed me. I never told anybody about that. Never told anybody about it. I didn't like who I was, who I lived, or anything. For years, I always thought, you know, you used to hear it all the time in AA about being kidnapped, you know. And I always thought I was kidnapped from a wealthy family. That was my idea. <laughs> Don't laugh. I still run the ad every now and then. <laughs> October 1950. Boy missing? I <laughs> they don't respond. But... uh I just felt different and I felt bad. And I looked out at the world and I didn't like what I saw. And that didn't change for a long, long time. I, uh, I, I laugh and joke about that very elite group called White Trash, but I need to tell you it took me a good 25 years sober to finally not feel that way. Isn't that something? It took me 25 years sober to realize that I'm brand new today because God says I am. And I don't care what anybody else says because they can't overrule it. You know, and that was important for me. That was important for me to, to 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 go through because you know Wayne did a great job going through the steps. But I think one of our biggest problems today is, and the steps really unload the garbage. But my biggest problem was not knowing my goodness. Not knowing my goodness. You know, you always heard that saying: when you point your finger at somebody else, there's three pointing back. Would you ever notice that's always in a negative nature? When you see someone else's defects, it's a reflection of your own. Well, guess what? What I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is when I see somebody else's goodness, it's a reflection of my own. It's the only way I can see it. If I name it, i got to claim it. I learned that here. And that was something for a guy like me to learn, because when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I did not deserve to breathe a breath. I was wasting air, and I knew it. I started something else when I was real young, and it took me years to quit it, years sober to quit it. And I could walk into a room of 200 or 300 people, and 299 could turn around and say, Ed, you're the best, man. We love you. And one could go, jerk. <laughs> Guess who got my full attention? <laughs> but here's the sick part. Not only did they get my full attention, but eventually the 299 didn't even exist anymore. It was just the ones. And if you're a little kid like I am and you start picking up those ones and putting them in your pack early, it gets heavy quick. And you need some relief. You need some relief. And thank God uh, my dad drank a lot. Thank God uh, he was alcoholic. Thank God for all that stuff I used to whine about. Because he started feeding me beer at a very early age, and I'm real pleased about it. Clancy always talks about going boom, and I was drinking before I knew what boom was. I, you know, All I knew is this. Eventually, if I took a few drinks, I felt better. The hole in my gut with the wind blowing through stopped. What I know now is peace is what I experienced chemically, but I never knew it. And I didn't recognize it when I had it. I just knew that I liked it. And eventually, whatever it took to get that sense, even in passing, I would do. If I had to steal it to get it, then I'd do it. And if I couldn't steal it, I'd lay down beside it and claim it, you know. Uh, whatever I had to do, whatever I had to take, whosever heart I had to break, my mothers, the ex-wives, the people who loved me. 
You know, uh, when I took my inventory, it wasn't the big podium stuff. You know, true story, one time in Scott County Jail, I beat a guy almost to death, and I was stark raving sober. That didn't bother me near as much as the look in my mother's eye. One more time. Beat me all you want. Take that memory away from me. And I was full of memories and what might have been and onlys. And thank God for booze. Thank God for booze because it preserved me to get me to you. I went to my first AA meeting when I was 10 years old. I've got a brother in South Carolina, sober 45 years. He's so dry, we don't let people smoke around him anymore. <laughs> fire hazard, dry, dry, fire hazard, you know. <laughs> but he's a good guy. He's a wonderful guy, and he took me to A&A. <laughs> and uh, I remember sitting there, and there was some old guy up here, about 30. You know, just absolute burnout, you could tell. My name's Fred, and I'm an alcoholic. And I thought, good for you, Fred, you know. <laughs> And I thought, you know, if I ever get old and burn out, I'll be here too. <laughs> I didn't know I was a prophet at that point. It <laughs> took years later. <laughs> and the reason I share that with you is just for one reason. I went back out there and, and I had ten more years of being on the streets and doing whatever I had to do. And I didn't once think, you know, i got to go back to A&A, walk up those twelve golden steps and find God. What I thought was if those cops would just leave me alone, I'd be all right. If I wasn't born to this family, I'd be all right. Anybody just cut me a break, I'd be all right. That was my problem. And alcohol made it disappear temporarily. I uh, was arrested by the Iowa Highway Patrol at the ripe old age of 13 for possession of a double-barrel 12-gauge shotgun that was 14 inches long. I had already gotten to the point where you weren't going to hurt me anymore. If there was going to be hurting, I'll do it. And I already got to admire the, the fact that uh, the cops may take me out and I'd be a hero. You know, when I came to AA, they lied to me. They said, you know, if you keep drinking and using, you're going to die. And I thought, cool, where do I sign up? And they said, you know, we want to restore your life. When I came to AA, I said, oh, no, thanks, I'll pass. <laughs> Rather have another one if you don't mind. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty much hell out there. Thank you very much. But, but they didn't get it. They didn't get it. I got it. Uh, that's all well-meaning stuff, but it isn't applicable to everybody. It certainly wasn't to me. It's like telling the God when I, I got sober when I was 20 years old. And people come up to me and say, Oh, it's so nice to see you young people get here before you really had to hurt. <laughs> And at that time, when I got sober, I was 20 years old. I had felony records as long as both arms. I had been committed to the Iowa State Mental Institution, termed psychotic, neurotic, insanely violent, hopelessly addicted to drugs, and chronic alcoholic. I'd been married and divorced, and they're saying, you haven't even been around the block yet. <laughs> I thought, how big is this block? <laughs> it gets much bigger. You guys are going to have to go for me. But, you know, I hear that from time to time, and I, I understand it's well-meaning when people say, oh, I wish I would have got it when I, I was your age. Oh, you wish you would have been dying then instead of now? Is that... <laughs> well, think about it. Would anybody here, and I, have, I hate cancer. I absolutely hate cancer. Take some wonderful people out of my life all the time. I hate cancer. So I don't mean any disrespect by this at all, believe me. But would any of us, if we had the cancer and recovered, Go into a young person's room who had cancer and say, oh, my cancer was worse than yours. Aren't you glad you didn't, have, you didn't hurt like I did? How stupid would that be? And what's the difference? You know, what's the difference? I, uh, January 5th of 1971, I got sober. I didn't mean to. Wasn't in my Palm Pilot. Nowhere. <laughs> no, wasn't there. Wasn't there? I, I was out and uh, I, I was going back to A and A from time to time, and uh, I had uh, I was one of those people that uh, used illicit drugs, as Johnny said. That back then we were called dope fiends. It was a lot more fun than addict. <laughs> oh, I'm a poo poo addict. I like dope fiend. You know, Johnny says it right. Dope fiend. 
And, uh, and I don't know about you, but I was a shaker. You know, we were talking at dinner. You don't see any good shakers anymore. They medicate them up too much. Yeah. We need some good shakers, you know. <laughs> How are you doing, Ed? Oh, good. How are you? God, for God's sakes, don't put anything in my head because you didn't know where it was going, boy. You know. <clears throat> and I had two rules. Don't get behind me and don't touch me. Very two simple, very rules. Very simple rules. And I, I, I'm real grateful there was an old guy, Harry S., Harry Stevens, passed away in central discussion. And I was sharing this with Wayne. It, it, it just came to me a few years ago how, how wonderful he was to me, and I didn't even know it. He'd pour coffee in the meetings at central discussion. Remember my two rules. Don't come up behind me and don't touch me, because I was quick. <laughs> and uh, Harry didn't care about my rules, basically. <laughs> Harry'd come by, and he'd pour coffee, and he'd put his hand right here on my shoulder. And he'd pour the coffee, and the strangest thing I'd ever known happened. I became peaceful. The voices stopped. The war stopped. And I was okay. And I could breathe. And then Harry'd go. And he'd fill some more cups. And I'd drink my coffee just as quick as I could. So Harry'd come back and touch me again. You see, I was too tough to tell you that, man, I needed that human touch so bad. That one of unconditional love. That one of purity and unadulterated love. Harry, he saved my life. And that's my only regret is I didn't say to him, Harry, you saved my life. It is important what we say to people in Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe. And like Wayne, I used to have one of those sarcastic mouths that I just deeply regret. Uh, but there was another guy I'll, uh, experience I'll share with you quick and was out at 26th and Broadway. A guy named Jimmy R., Jimmy Ryan, he passed away from a heart attack. But, but uh, Jim was from Texas. He lived in Malibu, and he was rapid-fire Texan. He'd talk like this. He'd give you three talks inside of one. You know what I mean? He was just rapid-fire. He said one time I asked some psychologist why I rubbed my hands together like this. He told me I smacked that dude right in the mouth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy was great. He was just wonderful. And I, in sobriety, went through a lot of deep, dark depressions as well. I work the steps, and I no longer have those depressions. I know that upsets a lot of people. <laughs> Pray for me. You know? Don't rationalize with me. Just pray for me. And uh, it was very important. It was very important because uh, I was in this deep, dark place. I was living in my sponsor's garage, and uh, things were looking up. And uh, <laughs> my plan was to go, two and a half years sober, mind you, my plan was to go and turn on the big coffee pots in the garage, let the gas go, and just go to sleep. Two and a half years sober. No notes. No funsies. I'm done. My head's saying, you're a failure at AA. It may work for those other folks. They're happy, Ed. But you're crazy. You're crazy. And, and I am not going to drink or use. So I only got one recourse. And eventually, if you work the program and in sobriety, you'll take that out as an option, too. But that was my plan. I was going to go home, uh, go home, go to the garage, turn on the gas. <laughs> it was home. Uh, go home, turn on the gas, and go to sleep. That was my plan. I walk into the club, and the, who's there but Jimmy Ryan? And if Jimmy said it to me once, he said it to me a thousand times. And if he saved me once, he saved me a hundred times. But I would walk up to Jim, and I'd say, Jim, how are you? And it was like the world stopped. And he looked right into my eyes and he said, I'm much better for seeing you, my friend. I'm much better for seeing you. He saved my life that day. Because if a nice guy like Jimmy likes me, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I'm worth saving. Now imagine if he would have said, get away from me, you crazy, self-obsessed jerk. Not Jimmy. I'm much better for seeing you, my friend. And I am extremely better for knowing Jim. So it is important, we say. I remember I was laying in the middle of the street. It was a car wreck that night. I was laying in the middle of the street pretending like I was knocked out. I'm not sure why. It seemed like a good idea at the moment. <laughs> and uh, 
the police came up, and I was like Wayne. I was a cop fighter. I don't care if you were crossing guard. If I saw a badge, I'd swing at you. you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I went up there and, and uh, was laying in the middle of the street. It was 18 below zero on this January night. And uh, I was laying in the middle of the street, and the cops come up and said, uh, that's mutum. Don't even touch him. He's the scum of the earth. Don't even cover the SOB. He's a punk. Car's probably hot. Just leave him lay there. To this day, I have no feeling in this little finger from the cement where it froze. But I'll tell you what was amazing to me is I didn't fight. For some reason that night, I agreed. For some reason that night, I knew that I was there by my own decisions. It wasn't about how I was raised, what I did or didn't have, how I was discriminated against because I was poor white trash and everybody else could get an education except me. It was none of that crap. It was called alcoholism. It was called Ed. And that combination put me there. And I knew where to come, thank God. But I didn't even have to make that decision. They took me to the hospital and they rolled me past this nurse and she said, Ed, want me to call AA? And I went, might as well. <laughs> now, us old timers want to know why you knew people can't be sincere like we were in the old days. You know? And some guy next day, next day came up, hap. Hap L., Hap Lincoln, he passed away. God bless you. Hap come up to the hospital, and God, there's nothing like being hungover and having a brain concussion and have somebody named Happy coming to see you. <laughs> and he walked in the room and said, Hi, Ed, my name's Hap. And I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, get out of my room. Jeez. <laughs> and I don't know why I got honest that day. I have no idea why. He said, we don't drink and we don't use one day at a time. And I said, you don't seem to understand. I can't make it a whole day. I can't make it a whole day without something to ease this mind. And he said, well, all you got to do is try. And that's the only thing I've done consistently for the last 33 plus years, 12,000 plus days, is try. Sometimes greatly, sometimes poorly. But I try. And I started going to meetings. And it was good. Old Logan was there. Logan, God bless him, we buried him last year with 56 years of sobriety. And I was about six months sober, and I had my feet up on the table, and Logan walked in. He said, you think you got all the answers, don't you, kid? And I said, no, but I was thinking, yep, pretty much got this wrapped up. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something. I was young once, but you've never been old. <laughs> I was young once, but you've never been old. It is the first time in my entire life I ever considered the possibility you have felt the way I feel. What an act of grace. What an act of opening that door so I could step in just a little bit more. Now, the trouble with getting sober is they bring up that three-letter word. You all know which one I'm talking about. Job. <laughs> Wayne understands. <laughs> And, of course, that other three-letter word, God. I was not like Wayne. I thought for years I was an atheist or an agnostic, but I had knowledge of a God, and I hated everything I knew. Sorry, but I did. You see, I was taught about a God that when I was 10 years old, I had a cousin named Linda who was wonderful. And if there was ever anybody God-like, it was Linda. She was wonderful. She was beautiful. She did everything right. She was an honor roll. She got a full scholarship. I just hated her and because uh, she was so good. But I also thought, you know, if there's anybody ever close to God, it's Linda. And one day she was walking to work and a truck hit her, knocked her 200 feet and killed her. And do you know the ones I picked out of that? Remember my 299 to 1? The ones I picked out were the people that said, God must have wanted an angel. Oh, so he hits you with a truck. <laughs> I'll pass. Still do. Pass. And I had that. In, in Where I lived, I saw things adults shouldn't see, let alone children. And everybody would say things like, God must have had a better purpose for him. God must have saved him from something else in their life. Well, I'll pass on this guy. Sounds like a punk to me. Still does. And I was angry. 
So you brought that stuff around me, we're going to talk. And I'll tell you something funny. A few years ago, I started a, a place where I'm building a retreat, please God. And my office is on that very corner my cousin was killed. And every day when I walk across that street, I celebrate Linda. You see, a few years back, I learned something about me. And Wayne touched on it today. But I learned something about me. About, about a year ago, a guy walked into my office and he said, uh, it was Monday, and he said, well, he said, uh, Friday, I'm really going to have a tough weekend. And I said, why is that? And he said, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. And I said, so you're planning your depression already? Is... <laughs> well, think about it. He said, what do you mean? I said, did you really love your daughter? He said, oh, yeah, more than death. I said, well, why don't you do this? Spend the whole day celebrating all the goodness she was in your life. All the joys and all the happiness and every good day you ever had. Make it a whole day of celebration and joy because she was in your life. Or do you want to make it all about you? You see, I'm an expert at making it all about me. It could be your tragedy, but I'd take it on. <laughs> Are you okay, Ed? Oh, I could take more. <laughs> And I learned that through the steps. Now, I'm not talking about normal grief. Please understand me. I'm not talking about normal grief. But I'm talking about the insistence on wringing every bit of pain I can out of a painful situation. Every bit of sickness, every bit of attention, every bit of wrangling I can do so the focus will be on me. I'll talk some more. And I've lost a lot of loved ones sober. Well, no, I didn't really. They just went into another room. Uh, well, that's the way I feel. It's like, you know, this, ain't, this stuff's nothing. Uh, and they went into another room. I didn't lose anybody. In fact, they're more with me today than they've ever been. That's what I've come to believe. And when I want to feel bad, it's just about being a little self-involved. There's a great story about a young man that lost his young son. And it, uh, he, he had a horrible time. Uh, he was grieving terribly because it is painful. God knows it's painful. And he, he had a horrible time forgiving uh, or, or accepting his son's death. And uh, he went to this guy, and the guy said, uh, I want you to imagine something. Went to this uh, doctor. And he, the doctor said, I want you to imagine something. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to see a string of young men and women walking up to the saints, uh, gates of St. Peter, and as they walk towards St. Peter, they light a candle. And then they walk through the gate. He said, do you see that wonderful picture? He said, yes, I do. He said, now I want you to look over on the right and see your son sitting on a bench all alone with his candle. And I want you to ask him why he's sitting there. And the man said, son, why are you sitting there? And the doctor spoke for the son and said, dad, every time I go to get my candle lit, your candle's drowned it out. He said, it's time to let your son light the candle. It's time for the healing to begin. And I just love that story. Because I had to let a lot of people light candles. It wasn't about me anymore. It was about letting them be at peace. What a relief. But I had all this trouble with God, as I said. And they, you know, uh, Wayne talked about good others do, good orderly direction. Man, that worked for me. I could deal with that. There was a, about six months sober, you get honesty. At about eight months, you get a little tack to go with it, you know. <laughs> I was at that six-month point, and Father Tom comes in. Father Tom was sober. All preachers and ministers and priests have thin blue lips to talk like this. I met a few rabbis that are like this, too. And uh, they all have thin blue lips, and Father Tom did. And he said, Ed, why don't you come back to church? <laughs> I had the honesty part of the program. I told him. I said, I don't go back to church because it's full of thieves, hypocrites, and liars. And I felt good. <laughs> Father Tom looked at me and smiled and said, Why don't you come, Ed? One more won't hurt. <laughs> I punished him. I didn't talk to him for months, you know. But there was something that threw me. I looked around at the old-timers and Alcoholics Anonymous, and they had a look in their eye that I couldn't quite explain. And I believe the eyes are the mirror of the soul. They absolutely are. 
And these old timers would talk about God, and I knew they were telling the truth. I didn't get the angle or how they were doing it, but I knew they were telling the truth. So I made almost a fatal mistake, newly sober. I started professing a faith I didn't have. I started professing a faith other than my own experience. You hear a lot of good, wonderful things in meetings, but if you don't know them and if you haven't experienced them, try to keep it to your experience is all I can tell you because it'll almost, it almost cost me my life because I got to a point where I needed that faith and it was not there. Tell you how that happened. I was about a year sober, and uh, I just celebrated my year's birthday. And the old man asked me over to the house, you know. And I don't know about you, but when my old man asked me over to the house, I'm in trouble. And I'd been hanging around A and A for a year. And you said I got to bring new attitudes into old situations. You know, I can't let them work my program. I got to bring my program into them. So they said, suit up, show up. So I went to dinner, and about halfway through dinner, Dad said, "Boy," and I thought, "Oh, here it comes." And I said, yeah, Pop. He said, just wanted to tell you I'm proud of you. And I need to tell you something. If you would have put a lie detector on me when I walked into that house and said, Ed, do you care what that old man thinks about you? I would have said no and it would have said true. How grateful I was that I was so wrong. How grateful I am that I was so darn wrong about so many things in my life that I absolutely knew was the truth. You see, when I came to AA, they said wonderful things had happened. Try to make a list of things you'd like to happen. That one wouldn't have made the list because, you see, that's impossible because I knew that old man hated me. No, what he wanted was for his boy to do better, and I just couldn't get it. Man, I left there, and it was one of the best nights of my life. And I, I went to a, a meeting, and I went to, to my sister-in-law's house afterwards, and I got a call from my mother who was crying and hysterical and said, Ed, come home quick. My dad went across the street to get him a quart of beer and me a bottle of pop, and now they're carrying out bodies, and I don't know what's going on. And I just never heard her that hysterical before. And I jumped in the car, and it was one of those ice storm nights. I don't know if you ever get them down here. Uh, probably not. <laughs> well, no, you know, when you get a, a, a layer of ice over everything, do you get those from time to time? See, and you know. <laughs> but uh, it was one of those nights where it was just solid ice everywhere. And I made it across town, and I pulled up to that bar, and there were more cops there than I'd ever seen. And it's funny, that year I was sober, those cops really shaped up. <laughs> if you're new tonight, you quit swinging, they'll quit arresting. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Keep this shut and just say yes, sir, and no, sir, and thank you, and you usually go home. <laughs> Who knew? And I went up there, and it was funny because those cops had uh, respected me because back then in Alcoholics Anonymous, we didn't have a lot of the fancy-dancy stuff we have now. Uh, we had just had one people, one drunk helping another. It was kind of cool back then. Didn't have all that outside interference. It's true. Absolutely true. It's killing people right and left, and people don't get it. But then we just went into court, and we, we hauled people to AA, so they would saw me in court every day. So they knew I was sober, and I walked into that... Uh, bar that I'd spent many a night in. I'd been drinking in there since I was 11 years old. They never ID'd me. And I walked in. There was an officer in there, and I, I sa he said, Ed, what are you doing here? And I said, my dad was in here. He said, oh, my God, Ed. And I said, what? What's going on? He said, all we know, Ed, is somebody came in and opened fire and shot everybody. And I looked down the bar, and I saw a pool of blood. I saw a pool of blood with my father's glasses all smashed up in it. And I didn't want to know. Didn't want to know, but I knew. Didn't want to, but I knew. And the officer said they took all the bodies up to the hospital, Ed. You'll have to go up there. And he was very nice, and he was very kind. And I went up to the hospital, and I ran into an officer that hadn't forgotten the old days. And he was rude and vulgar and abrupt, a guy named Iverson. God bless him. And... Uh, he suggested to me that he'd identified all the bodies and I better get out of there or he'll have me arrested. And an AA miracle happened. I said okay and I turned around and went away because I'm a cop fighter. And a year and a half before that they would have been looking for a new lieutenant, I don't mind telling you. But you see, hanging around, you changed my heart and changed my mind and I didn't even know it. I honest to God didn't know it. I just knew my heart ached more than it had ever ached in my life that night. 
And I went home and I called the one guy that I would have never dreamed I called. He was a lieutenant of the narco division, Bob Garner. <laughs> and for the last five years of my life, he tried to put me behind bars. He got me in the back of the squad one day and said, Ed, if I see you leaving the scene of the crime, or think I see you leaving the scene of the crime, I'm going to shoot to kill and not stop. And I said, everything's fair in love and war, chump. We had a wonderful report. That's the guy I called. You know why? He knew I was sober. And he said, Ed, what's going on? And I said, Dad was in the shamrock. He said, oh, my God, Ed, hold on. And he loved me that night. I used to say he was kind to me. He loved me that night. He fed me information he wasn't supposed to feed me. He gave me thoughts and ideas that were going on at the station that nobody should have knew. But he knew my heart was broken. And he knew what I used to be like. And he knew it was a flat miracle I was sober. And he fed me the information. He said, all we can come up with, Ed, is that he was either shot and uh, they took him with him, took him hostage, or he shot and he wandered outside and we'll form a search party and we'll search for him. And uh, I'd always hoped you wouldn't know that feeling. And then September 11th happened, that needless act of homicide that's so hard to understand. And you're just empty and hollow and horrified all at once. And you just walk around in a daze, and you're looking under parked cars for your dad and in the street corners, and you, uh, you don't want it, but you got to look because he might be there. And the only thing I could remember that night was the serenity prayer, and I could only remember it one word at a time, thanks God. And that's the only thing I had going. And the next morning, I walked, up to the, I walked back to the house, and Mom said, Ed, there's a phone call for you. And I got on the phone, and it was an officer from the police, uh, the policeman from the night before from the hospital. And he said, well, Ed, come on up. Anybody could have made a mistake. We need you to identify your old man. And I said, okay. And I walked up there, and I walked into that morgue, and I saw my father laying there with that bullet hole in his face. And I reached for that faith I'd been professing. And I come up with a handful of nothing because it wasn't mine. It was nice thoughts, but it was nothing of mine. And I don't know that I've ever felt more alone or more sad than I felt that moment. And I walked out the door, and guess who was there? A member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what they did? They looked at me and just gave me a little wink, gave me a thumbs up. And Wayne wonders how I show up when his daughter's sick because I was taught by the very best. And everywhere I went, there were people from AA, everywhere. The police station, the funeral home. It was still Iowa's most heinous crime, and they, you know, it was just thousands of people come to the funeral, and it was just amazing, and I was just torn. I, I, I couldn't get it because I was trying to pray to this God, and I thought I had something going, but... Then this whole idea, this God and this, you know, taking people to heaven and shoots people in the face and hits them with trucks. And I, man, went to the funeral and there was a guy named Father Grubb there, did the funeral, and he gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. About halfway through the funeral, he said, you know, a lot of people would say Clifford's death is God's will. And he said, I don't believe that. And I sat right up in the pew. He said, I believe God created human beings and gave them a free will. Some of those people chose to do this act, and now it's God's will. Man, you mean the reason Linda died is there was human error? Yeah. Do you mean all those people died September 11th because somebody had real evil thoughts and drove planes into buildings, and God weep louder than we could imagine? Yeah. You mean all the loved ones I'm dying of that are dying of cancer, God's not taking them, but we're polluting everything we touch and we want to blame it on everybody else. Yeah. I don't know about you, but in my heart and mind, if it isn't good, it isn't God. Why are the children starving on all over the country, including this one, all over the world, including this country? Real simple. We don't feed them. More than enough food. Don't blame God anymore. What a freedom that was. You know, early on, I kind of hoped I could believe in a God that was kind and loving and forgiving. On one of the worst days of my life, I got that gift. You see, that's the way my God works. 
the most heinous, worst things in my life. He'll give me gifts beyond measure if I just pay attention and stay around long enough to use them. Shortly after that, uh, they caught the guys that did it, and they called me in. The guy was sitting there, and one of the guys uh, was sitting there, and he had his attitude and his little do and acting tough. And I thought, you know, you give me five minutes with him, we don't need a trial. I'll take care of that punk now. And I was dead serious. I wasn't talking about slapping him around a bit. I would have took him out. And A&A ruined me. (laughs) They told me I had to go into court and behave myself. (laughs) That I might be the only example of AA anybody ever sees, and you got to put on your suit. And I had a great fitting suit. (laughs) And I went into court, and I did my testimony. Yeah, that's him, and yeah, that's my dad. And I left. Shortly after that, uh, they were all convicted and sent to prison. And I thought I was done with it. I really did. And uh, shortly thereafter, God talked to me. Now, you've got to be careful when God talks to you. I, got, I believe God does talk to you, but sponsors are wonderful filters for when God calls. <laughs> I remember one time I went up to my sponsor and I said, Sponsor, I got this message from God. And he said, What is it, Ed? And I told him, and he said, You know, this message from God looks strangely like your handwriting, Ed. <laughs> So that's wonderful. But I also believe with all sincerity, 86, 87, 88 tells me I'm going to be inspired if I take time to pray and make that connection. I absolutely believe that and live that today. I don't live in insanity anymore because I don't have to. And that's very important for me. But God talked to me and he said something very simple. I was in Galesburg, Illinois. He said, Ed, go out to California. Get into show business. Made sense to me, right, Wayne? (laughs) Went to Anaheim, California, where all stars get their start. I got a job at Disneyland. I was goofy. (laughs) Little did they know how well I fit the role at that point. But, you know, I never actually started that job. What happened? No, what happened was I went up to a meeting in West L.A., and it was on a Tuesday night. And there was an enthusiasm in there. There was a spirit uh, Tuesday night in West L.A., and it was just a magnet. It was living, breathing people in meetings, talking about life, talking about living, talking about going forward instead of looking back. And I'm not putting down any AA I'd been around, but I'm used to being in a meeting and flipping Fred a chip once a year. There you go, Fred. (laughs) Happy birthday now. That's pretty much it. (laughs) This group was doing things. They played softball. They played volleyball. They moved one another. They did everything. If anybody needed anything, we did it for them. It was called the fellowship of men and women who shared everything they had to help one another in living color. And I loved it. I went up there the next week and There was some guy running around. I hadn't had a sponsor in two and a half years. I was a little too spiritually fit for that, I thought. (laughs) And uh, there was this guy running around the meeting. I said, excuse me, would you you be my sponsor? He said, no. I kind of knew the ANA rule, you know. If somebody asks you to be a sponsor, you've got to be the sponsor. And he said, no. And I said, why not? He said, anybody I sponsor has to look up to me. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. I thought, oh, good, tall jokes. That's that's going to make me feel good. (laughs) And a few minutes later, he came up and he said, if you agree to do a few things, I'll be your sponsor. My name's Clancy. (laughs) And I am forever grateful I didn't hear the crap that goes on around about him, whether it be true or not. For one simple reason. I would have believed you and I would have died because I respected. And you would have killed me by your gossip and your rumors. I make it my utlevel best not to put down any group or individual in AA. I may not like them at all. But they may be the guiding light that you need. And who do I think I am to take their inventory? Might be just what you need. You know, I I get to travel a lot and I hear people say, I've never been to a bad AA meeting. And I always say, you need to double up on your meetings, what you need to do. (laughs) You're not getting it near enough. (laughs) And the reality of that is, you know, 
uh, people do things differently than I understand it, and today I celebrate it rather than get aggravated about it because those rooms are full. And hopefully they'll get to what I understand to be Alcoholics Anonymous someday. And all I can do to do that is be the example that I am. Hold me accountable. You see me misbehaving anywhere. You got my permission. Call me on it. I learned a long time ago being sober is more than going to a meeting for an hour and simulating recovery. It's how you treat the dog on a bad day. It's how kind and courteous you are to that significant other even when you don't feel like it. It's how you're treating that driver in front of you, justified or unjustified. Wayne reminded me of something I just... I was down in Louisville a couple of years ago. And the guy said, hi, Ed, how are you? And I said, fine, how are you? He said, do you remember me? And I said, no, no, I really don't. Because I didn't. He said, we used to go to meetings together in Los Angeles. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, I remember the last time you and I were in a meeting together. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you knocked the guy out with one punch. (laughs) God, I didn't want that information. You know, (laughs) you don't understand. I'm next to God now. (laughs) But I remember that night. And I'm sharing it. Number one, you don't do that in an AA meeting. That's totally unacceptable behavior. No, no, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That's what bothered me is I broke one of the rules that... uh, I'd been taught. I mean, as that guy was flying over the fourth row, I was thinking, how am I going to explain this to Clancy? (laughs) Of course, I didn't realize I didn't have to. (laughs) He understood completely. But uh, (laughs) let me tell you how that occurred. I'm sitting in a Thursday night meeting. It was down in Culver City at that time, and it was 30 minutes of participation, coffee break, and main speaker. We're doing the participation part. And uh, uh, a guy was sitting in front of me talking, a guy named Barry O., cameraman. And uh, uh, I tapped him on the show. I said, excuse me, I can't hear the participants. He went, oh, okay. Well, at the coffee break, he turns around and he said, don't you ever touch me again. And I said, oh, uh, I'm sorry if you misunderstood. I just couldn't understand. And little Alice come running up and said, Big Ed, sit down. Big Ed, I said, honey, I'm fine. I'm doing fine. I'm just explaining to the guy. So I turned around and explained some more. And I, honest God, thought I was doing just fine. And then Barry said, don't you ever touch me again. Right here. Next thing I know, he's going over chairs. And I think, you know, I've misjudged this situation. I really felt bad about it. I went over and I brushed him off and talked to him. I sponsored him for the next five years. He said, he said no sponsor had ever been able to get his attention. So I... But I don't say that with pride, what I, you know, that whole thing. And it's, it's funny now, yet it's sad, because I was, I was what, uh, 13 years sober? But I never dealt with the anger that I had, the anger that I had. It was killing me, stark, raven, sober, and I didn't even know it. If you asked me, I was doing fine, and I believed it. See, Alice could see it. My friend Alice, God bless her, she was, Big Ed, sit down. Big Ed said, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> Shortly after that, I was going out to Thousand Oaks, going out the the freeway there, and some guy in an Audi cut me off and slammed on the brakes and flipped me off. Well, in California, you can beat up people pretty regular, and it's pretty good fun. And, uh, right, it gets crazy. And uh, he flipped me off and then told me to pull over, and I thought, cool, okay. (laughs) He pulled over. He got out of his Audi. Come running back. I unfolded out of my car, and his eyes got this big. And I grabbed him by the crotch in the shirt and threw him over his car. And then I thought, I'm going to speak something. I did, I did, I did what any good AA would do. I went around and I picked him up and I brushed him off. And his eyes are this big and I said, you know, I'm a member of his 12 step <laughs> program and when we're wrong, we need to promptly admit it and make it. He left for some reason. Didn't let me finish. And I don't know about you, but that was, uh, that was extremely unacceptable to me. And I had justified it for a long time. 
because I was around people who like to justify anger in a lot of different ways. And it ain't about them. It's about I'm responsible for my actions, not anybody else. And I really realized that I had to, as the book says, give up fighting anything or anybody or I was going to die. I remember I uh, was going to speak in Pasadena, California, and I was living on Venice Beach that long before it got famous. And uh, <laughs> I'm broke. I'm flat broke, and I'm thinking, I'm speaking in Pasadena, wealthy area. I may hook up, pick up a few bucks. And I caught myself doing that con. And what I did is when I realized that with God, I started fresh and new. My first honest prayer I ever said is, God, I don't know if you're there or not. I sure hope so. That was the truth. It was honest. It's all I knew. And I caught myself running that little con, and I went into that bathroom, and I said the same prayer in that bathroom I said up, as I said upstairs before I came down here tonight to supper. And I said, God, save me from my own nonsense. I used to use another descriptive word than nonsense. <laughs> But I find nonsense works just fine now. And it's God save me from my own nonsense and let me share the miracle you've performed in my life through Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't want anything from this people, absolutely nothing. And I went and I talked. And after the meeting, a guy came up to me and said, this makes no sense to me. We'll offer you a job. said, makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> he said, have you ever been in Taiwan? I said, no. He said, have you ever been in show business management? He said, no. He said, be in my office Monday morning. Uh, I went to the office. Monday morning, on Thursday, I was lifting out of LAX, Los Angeles International Airport, on China Airlines. I was going to Taipei, Taiwan. I was the new soon-to-be vice president of America on Ice. I had a cast of 63. I was going to Taipei to negotiate the ice rink and building of the rink and the costumes and flying back and forth with designer Bill Campbell to Hong Kong to build the costumes. How was your week? <laughs> now, the only reason I share that with you is for one thing. Isn't it amazing I showed up for the interview? You had taught me to drop the bag of ones. I'm worthy today. I shared it with somebody at supper, and I don't know if they got it or not, but I'll share it again. For the first time in my life, I'm innocent most of the time. I'm not guilty anymore. What a gift. What a gift. And I could go and I could be present. And I could talk about my past as an open book. I like Wayne. I don't sugarcoat any of it. Why? Can't hurt me anymore. My past doesn't own me. God does in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And with those two owners, I'm under good ownership. And they ain't selling me out anytime. And uh, it was fun. I got off the plane over there, and I, I got off the plane, and everybody's this tall. <laughs> And I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me. And I know it's just a matter of time before they time me down. <laughs> it's coming, Matty. <laughs> and I remember I looked out, and there was a guy there with my, bad, my name badly misspelled, my chauffeur. And I got into my Mercedes limo, and they took me up to the President Hotel into my six-room suite. And I walked in, and I belonged there. You know why? Because God put me there. I quit arguing. You know, I hear a lot of well-meaning people. I say, how are you doing? They say, better than I deserve. And I say to them, God's still wrong, huh? <laughs> Think about it. We're no good at accepting gifts, especially just of grace. Saying thank you, simply thank you. Clancy taught me that. One time I remember I was in the group and I, I, I was broke and he come up and he slipped me five bucks. And, uh, you know, in his hand the way he slipped it. Clancy always does stuff like that and always has, but you never hear that about him. And uh, I remember he took his hand away and I looked at that five bucks and I said, oh, oh, I can't take this, I can't take this. And Clancy in his kind and loving way <laughs> looked at me and said, shut up! Why don't you just shut up? <laughs> why, does, why can't you just say thank you? Why do you got to destroy the spirit of the giver? Why does it always have to be about you? <laughs> now I just simply say thank you when someone says something. <laughs> One of the biggest grows I have because it isn't about me and I don't want to taint your spirit ever again. This weekend, a lot of people have said some wonderful things about me. 
And I know they're true because they shared them with me. And it isn't about me, but it's about how you made me. The person I am today. You know. I, Wayne said he's satisfied. I used the term for the first time in my life, I'm enough. I don't need anything more. Me, my God, my program, I don't need anything more. I don't need the relationship. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> we won't even go there. <laughs> well, I lied. Yeah, we will. I'm gonna... <laughs> About, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we got to end pretty quick anyway. Uh, about 10 years ago, well, first I left uh, the, uh, America on Ice. I was with them. Uh, while I was in Kaohsiung, a guy said, you know, you'd be an excellent manager for the Harlem Globetrotters. I went, yeah, sure. I went home, and the Harlem Globetrotters called me up, and then I traveled all over the world as a business manager for the Harlem Globetrotters in the year of Lemon and Curly Neal, the wonderful. And uh, that was a gift. I don't, want to, I don't want to forget to share that with you, not because it's something about me, but Remember where I started laying in the middle of the street? You tell me any other explanation but an act of mercy and grace to put me as manager of the Harlem Globetrotters. There just is no other. Now I lost my place, Wayne. It's rubbing off. <laughs> Must be this spot in the floor. <laughs> Oh, relationships. Thank you. I, uh, about ten years ago, I was married. I got married when I was with the Globetrotters. I met the daughter of the Turkish ambassador. She was Turkish. She was Muslim. She was beautiful. She was wealthy. And I thought, our backgrounds are a lot alike. And we should have never been married. I don't say that to be smart. I don't say that to be rude. I say that as a matter of fact. For a lot of years, I made a lot of excuses. It was a bad mistake that we got married. And there were three children that I love dearly who absolutely hate every breath I take. And I'm not able to spend much time with them at all because they really hate me. Why I share that with you is not anything about me, but it's for the wonderful program of Al-Anon that can do so much healing for broken hearts and sad hearts and the anger. There's some of us out here who have loved ones that haven't experienced that gift yet. So if you've got someone in that other fellowship, celebrate it. Believe me. And uh, about ten years ago, I was uh, at a Christian retreat, and I had a spiritual awakening. And, and, and Very much like Bill said, it was a, a moment that changed my heart and my mind from that moment to this. And God said, I want you to be a minister. And uh, I said, okay. And I'd never been one before, so it was kind of tough. <laughs> but in three weeks, I had my church. I went to the Methodist church, and if you're breathing, you're in, you know. Well, I mean, there's a terrible crisis. Not so much anymore. One of the gifts of September 11th is more people are entering the ministry and the clergy. Thank you, God. That's one of those gifts that he brings out of tragedy. He didn't cause that to happen, so that would happen, but that's a gift because that happened, I believe. And uh, within three weeks, I was doing uh, services, and I was doing sermons, and I was just, uh, and then they told me, we need you to go get your BA, and we need you to go get our Masters of Divinity, and they said it was 220 hours of college credit, and I didn't tell you before, but I got kicked out of school in seventh grade, <laughs> and I quit paying attention a few years before that. <laughs> But I know this, when God calls me to do something, I'm not going to argue. So I went over to the university and uh, walked in and I said, excuse me, I'd like to go to school. And they said, how many credits do you have? And I said, I have bad credits. Why? What's that about? <laughs> and they laughed like you did. But it was the gift Wayne shared sometime today. I was able to look him in the eye and say, you don't seem to understand. I don't know how to go to school. I'm not sure if I'm smart enough to pass a class. Will you help me? And, of course, they said yes. Because when you look people in the eye and you're honest with them, God is in our midst, I believe. And a healing begins. And I started the school. And I didn't clep and I didn't take any special classes to give me credit for what I'd done because I'd been so against education. I thought, by gosh, if I'm going to get these, I'm going to get every hour. 
so 220 hours later, when I got my master's and when I got my BA. Now, what does that have to do with relationships, you say? <laughs> when I got called into the ministry, I knew that I had to hold myself to a standard higher than I'd ever held before. Now, I believe this. This is not put on anybody else. I believe this for me. Being a circuit speaker in AA, I need to be above reproach to the best of my ability. And I had a real problem for a lot of years. I liked the ladies. But when I got into the ministry, I knew I had to raise that up too, and that had to change. So I said, God, if you want anybody in my life, you got to hit me with two by four. Because I ain't going there. I'm not going to risk my reputation in AA. I'm not going to risk my reputation as a pastor. See if I can get lucky. Because I, I, I don't like luck anymore. I like blessings. And I'm speaking out in Oklahoma. And this gorgeous woman walks up to me. And I'd seen her for about two years. Well, but I'm, I mean, ta- seen her there. I'm not seeing her. But she was beautiful. You couldn't help but miss her. I mean, not miss her. And she came up to me after I talked, and she said, Ed, I want to talk to you. Can I? I said, sure. She said, I'm just crazy about you. I hope that doesn't offend you. And I said, no, it doesn't at all. <laughs> and when she turned around, I went, thank you, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> But I tried to the best of my ability to practice the life of celibacy, and I did so in that case, and we talked, and we spent a lot of time talking, and uh, we spent about four weeks talking, and then it started getting crazy. <laughs> and if she was going to be happy, I needed to do this, and if she was going to be happy, I needed to do that. And you know what I did? This lovely woman, I called up and I said, you know, honey, I'm sorry, I don't do crazy anymore. Amen. You need to work with your sponsor. You need to do all that. You do that. Uh, But I don't do crazy anymore. And I left her alone. How healthy, you know? How healthy. It's too healthy. Oh, I need her. (laughs) But that's so healthy, you know? And I learned that here. I learned that here. I learned that if I want to change, you change. I remember walking up to Clancy and I said, Clancy, how do you be a gentleman? Man, that's a tough question. I wanted to ask that to people for years. I said, how do you be a gentleman? He said, you act like one, Ed. I would have never thought of that. (laughs) How do you change the way you live? By doing it. You want a better relationship with God? Then act like it. You want to be closer to God in these steps? Then work them. It's not a big mystery. You know, Dr. Bob's last talk, I just love. It's been ringing through my head. I spoke at Akron last year, and it was wonderful. And uh, uh, I've just, it's just been a moving, wonderful year, and a lot of things around Dr. Bob and his family. And in his last talk, to paraphrase it, he said, let's not louse this thing up with Freudian complexities. He said, let's keep it simple. Let's not louse this up with Freudian complexities. But then the second line is equally important to me. He said, what may be of interest to the scientific mind has little or nothing to do with our actual AA work. You know, we've forgotten that. AA is about me sharing my heart with you. One drunk talking to another. Cliff and I walking into a meeting terrified, but knowing if we walk in together, we'll walk out sober. We've got to remember that. We've gotten too far away, in my opinion, from what Alcoholics Anonymous is. It isn't a social club. It's a place where you can't get people to make a 12-step call, or worse yet, people who don't know what a 12-step call is. You know, it's more than verifying insurance. (laughs) We better get to know that because things are closing down right and left, and we're going to have a call and a strain on this fellowship, I believe, like we haven't had in years. We need to get back to Alcoholics Anonymous. At least that's what I think. I, uh, I, uh, uh, was out in California and made a few decisions based on self that cost me everything I owned. <laughs> Matt was there during that time. We were talking about that. Had a beautiful apartment in Burbank. We were wheeling and dealing. Matt and I were living together. <laughs> One day I said, Matt, how about here, bud? Going to Iway. <laughs> and I said, take the stuff, sell it, do whatever you want to do. I, I got to go. 
and I left Iowa and I come back to uh, left for Iowa and I came back in '88, and uh, it was an amazing time because what it did was it allowed me to start over. You know, the greatest gift I feel we've got in Alcoholics Anonymous or in Al-Anon or any of the, really any of the 12-step programs is any time we want, we can start fresh. You don't have to drink to start fresh. This whole idea that you're, you, you're owed a relapse is crap. You don't have to drink ever again if you don't want to. This is living proof that you can do that. And that's what I want. You know, I was preaching about three years ago, and I was preaching on forgiveness, oddly enough. And I got about halfway through my sermon, and I realized... I hadn't forgiven the guys who killed my father. That's not quite true. I'd forgiven them, but I hadn't told them. And that's just half an amend. I believe a little different than Wayne does on 8 and 9. I have come to believe that 8 and 9 has absolutely nothing to do with me. It has to do with healing the damage I did. It isn't about me. It's about making right the damage I did. And uh, I'm halfway through this sermon on forgiveness, and I catch that, and I stop right in the middle of it. And I told my congregation, I said, you know, I need to tell you something. I was preaching on the verse, uh, don't bring, uh, you know, if you've got any problems with your brothers, don't come to this altar. Take care of them first, then come here. And I realized I hadn't cleared that up. So I made a covenant with them right there that I'd seek out the guys that killed my father and uh, let them know that they were forgiven. As God would have it, two and a half weeks later, uh, one of the guys' sentence was overturned. I didn't even know he was trying for an appeal, you know, and it got overturned. And I'll tell you how well Alcoholics Anonymous work. I could not remember their names. I know that's hard to believe. The people that murdered my father, I can't, could not remember their names. Because his name is Sherman, and I'll leave his last name out of it, uh, but I, was, I kept saying Sherman Williams, the paint. <laughs> but I couldn't remember and the press came to me because in my community, I'm pleased to tell you because of the way you've taught me to behave and live that I'm well respected and I'm loved. And the press came to me and said, uh, Reverend Ed, what do you think? And I said, you know, it's time to heal. It's time to forgive. It's time to, time to start fresh. And they said, well, he went in there when he was 17. He doesn't know how to work. It's maximum security prison for 27 and a half years. What's he going to do? How's he going to support himself? And I said, he can come live with me if he wants. And people were taken back by that. And I'm not sure why. Cliff and Pat let me into their house. I knew what I was capable of. Nothing that that boy didn't. You let me into your homes. How dare I? How dare I not let him into mine? And that story literally went around the world. Oprah called me. 48 Hours called me. AP stories. Everybody's called. How could you do that? How could you do that? How could you do that? And you know, you just couldn't say, well, say it's called step eight and nine. And if you, <laughs> if you really work them, Oprah. <laughs> but it was amazing. And uh, as God would have it, two and a half weeks later, I was walking down a prison, prison hallway and a uh, I saw a guy I hadn't seen in 27 and a half years. Last time I saw him, I was in a courtroom, and I thought, you give me five minutes with him, we don't need a trial. And that uh, cell door opened, and he looked at me, and he didn't know what to expect. And I looked him right in the eye, and I put out my hand, and I said, Sherman, my name is Reverend Ed Mutum, and I'm here to tell you that God loves you, and I love you. And God forgives you, and I forgive you. And if there's anything I can ever do to make your life better, please allow me to do that. And I believe he looked in this old-timer's eyes and he knew I wasn't lying. He couldn't quite figure it out, but he knew I was telling the truth. And the healing began. A couple weeks went by and they decided to retry Sherman. State of Iowa, if you're caught in an act of a felony with someone, you're guilty. Life imprisonment. And I went down to the county attorney who knows and trusts me and respects me. And I asked him to give my friend a break. And he said, Ed, the guy's conning you. And I said, he don't even know I'm here. I'm asking you to give my friend a break. Let him plead to second-degree murder. Let him come home. And he listened to me. And it took us two years to get him home. And the state of Iowa gave me the privilege to go up to the jail. In fact, they'd only release him to my custody. And I picked him up. And I got to take him out and I got to buy him his clothes and figure out what size he was because he'd only wore a prison issue for the last 30 years then. 
got to give him a key to an apartment so he could open his own door. I remember we went out of a restaurant right after he was released, and I said, now when we get in here, the waitress is going to ask you a bunch of questions. She isn't trying to hassle you. She's just trying to get information. Like, how do you like her eggs? Over easy? Toast? Or what's out? And, you know, he's used to. And uh, so I said, Don't, they're not trying to hassle you. They're just doing it. And we walked out of that restaurant, and he said, Reverend Mutum, can we just stop for a minute? And I said, sure, Sherman. What? He said, I just want to look at that pond for a minute. It's been 30 years since he'd been able to look at a pond. It's been 30 years before, since he could open his own door without fear of being shot. And we think we got it tough because we're alcoholics. How about being a stupid punk kid afraid to say no to a bunch of ruffians and spend 30 years paying back for it? That's hell on earth. He goofed up. He went back to prison. Last March, they called me up, and he got out again. He said, I don't know if you want to talk to me. I said, sure, I want to talk to you. And he came back home, and he started again, and right now he don't like me much. It's funny how things change. So I usually don't ask people to do anything, but I'm going to ask that you pray for my friend Sherman. Thirty years in maximum security prisons is beyond my imagination. He's got more demons in his head than I can imagine, and I've had a lot of them. But he's a good man. I know that in my heart. I've seen it in him. And he's lost right now. So if you get an extra minute, say a prayer for Sherman and all the people like him that aren't in rooms like we have, that we can talk to one another and we can heal. Two years ago, I was, I was with the Methodist Church for eight years, and they had always okayed me to go out talking once a month on a Sunday, uh, one Sunday a month to go talk. And we got in a new bishop, and the bishop said... Uh, Ed, uh, if you want to continue doing that, you're going to have to leave the Methodist Church. Well, my decision's obvious. Here I am. <laughs> but uh, it was not easy decision. It was in one sense. I knew that I wouldn't stop giving back what you've given me. But I was at a church, 1,200 people, and it was full of 299s. There was about three people who didn't like me. The rest loved me, and that's who I remember. They had a roast for me at the church when I left. And 450 people showed up. And one spokesman got up and said, we don't want to say anything bad at all about Pastor Ed. What we want to do is tell him that we love him. And we're grateful for the time he's given us. And we understand what he's got to do and that we'll be praying for him. And you'll always be in our prayers. Thanks for being you. Priceless. Priceless. I wouldn't trade anything for that. Nothing you could give me could take that. You know, we're in a day and a time when a lot of things aren't too sure, but I'm sure of a couple things. Each day I want to get closer to God. I asked Chuck C. years ago, how do you pray? And he said, your every thought's a prayer, Ed. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> Did a little edit of what I'd been thinking and knew I wasn't in too good a shape. But I simply ask myself this, well, if it's crap, why am I thinking it? I decided to change my mind. And I try to make my every thought a prayer. And I'm closer to it than I've ever been, and i still got a long way to go, but I like what's happening. About two years ago, I was watching a show that I like to watch, Actor Studio. And this actor was on there, and I uh, can't remember his name right now, but uh, he was on there, and at the end of the show... Uh, the interviewer always says, if there is God, if there is a heaven, when you die, what would you hope God would say to you when you approach those pearly gates? And he thought for a minute, and he looked up at the interviewer, and he said, thank you. Best sermon I've ever heard. What if we lived our life so when we died, God said, thank you. See, all my life I was seeing what God could do for me. I think I want to do my life so if I get a chance to go to those gates, God looks at me and says, Thanks, Ed. Job well done. Day at a time. Thank you. Oh.